Connors T, how are ye? Welcome to the Candle Tales podcast and another episode where my sister Sorka will be telling the fall of the Fianna. This is all lining up, of course, for St. Patrick's Day. We have a special story coming live on the 17th of March in MVP in Dublin. Do check out our uh, website for tickets. And of course, this podcast is proudly sponsored by our Patreon supporters. They've gone to pa- patreon.com forward slash Candle Tales. And anything else, you can always reach out with suggestions or collaborations. We're looking forward to a few more by the end of the month. And without further ado, hey, Sarka, tell us a story, will you? Fionn McCool led the Fianna from strength to strength for so many years. It seemed for a time that it would never end their glory days. The days when every house in the land had three doors, a front door and a back door and a door that the Fianna could knock on. And everyone, north, south, east, west and centre, would open their door to the Fianna, receive gifts and give them. And they were heroes and they protected those weaker than them. And they were poets. They made songs and stories about their deeds. And they were loved. And they loved the people in return. And more than that, they loved one another. The men and women of the Fianna, like a great family. They fought for each other, they died for each other. Their loyalty was their strength. And yet Fionn began to feel as time went on and no great successor presented themselves. He began to feel that this was all a weight on his shoulders. And although his hair was snow white, his vigour and his strength was undimmed but he began to worry that one day he might falter, one day he might weaken, and all those he loved might come to grief because of it. And so he found a place on the coast, a place where he could test himself. There was a narrow shelf on one side, and then a great chasm falling down to the hungry rocks and the waves below, and then on the other side, there was a narrow ledge, not deep enough for his whole foot to fit on. If he leapt too far, he would dash against the cliff and bounce back and fall. If he did not leap far enough, he would plummet to his death. It was a test of strength, of agility and of precision and Fionn assessed it. And then he stood on the first narrow ledge. There was no way to run up to this jump, and he gathered his strength and he leapt. And he hung for a moment in the air. And then he landed, light. And then he walked around and gathered his weapons and went on his way, satisfied for now that his strength was not failing him. He repeated this test, this test of himself, this test of his strength, every year. And as long as he could make the leap, he was confident that he could still lead the Fianna. But the end, when it came, it was not Fionn's strength that failed him. And it began far sooner than he realised. As one by one the next generation fell away, battles were fought, and the Fianna died, and always it seemed that the young ones died, the old, Fionn, and Gull McMorna, and Conan Moel and Quilche. They remained, they survived, they fought like the legends they were. But it was the younger ones. 
the warriors in their first battle against the cat heads and the dog heads. They were the ones who fell in their droves. They were the ones who did not come back. They were the ones who could not be replaced. For the Fianna were elite and Fionn would not relax their tests. He would not diminish them by allowing lesser warriors to join. To do so would be to undermine the very band he had created, that he had fostered. All those that he had trained to his exacting standards. And so their numbers began to dwindle. The losses grew harsher. Dirmed Odivna's betrayal stung like a wound. Oshin, his own son, left him for a fairy woman. And the sons and the daughter of Dirmed, when they came back, they came for vengeance, not fellowship. And Dirmed's daughter Eirtok was stabbed in the back. There was still hope. Oscar, Oshin's son, was bright and fierce and fearless and as brilliant a warrior as Fionn had ever seen. But still, it began to seem like nothing could come right. Old wounds flared up, old scars ached. At a feast one day, the question of tribute in Scotland led to a quarrel between Fionn and Gull McMorna, and Gull brought up the feud that had been between him and Fionn's father, Cool, the feud that Gull had ended on a battlefield, killing Fionn's father. An old quarrel, to be sure, one that they had settled long, long before, but this time... When it flared, the bitterness flared up in Fionn. He thought what his life would have been if he'd had a father to guide him. If he'd ever known the love of a father, the kind of father he had tried to be for so many of the Fianna. And he could not bring himself to shrug his shoulders, clasp Gull McMorna's hand, let it all go to rest again. A bitterness gnawed at him, and Gull McMorna left the feasting hall, taking all his kinsmen with him, half the Fianna, all of them. And Fionn thought surely Gull would come back in a day or two, apologise, and he supposed he would forgive him and they would make it right again, but that was not what happened. Young Aed McMorna killed Fionn's lover and Aed was killed by Oscar in return and now it was a blood feud between Clan Bashkna, Fionn's clan and Clan Morna and Clan Morna swore never to return and Gull holed himself up in a cave by the beach starved himself to death a miserable death for a great warrior, he did not fall by sword or spear. He fell, feasting on seaweed and salt air, refusing to come out and face Fionn McCool in battle. And in bitterness and rage, his brother Conan Moel took all Clan Morna, and all of them set their hearts against the Fianna. It had happened before, of course. Before Fionn's time, this was how the Fianna had been, splintered and divided, Clan Bashkna hiding out in the woods, Clan Morna the only real Fianna recognised by the High King. But then Fionn had had youth and optimism on his side and now he could not see a way back. He could not see, even if Conan Wael came and begged for forgiveness, a thing that Conan Wael would never do. He could not see how he might give it. So he waited, 
the growing sense of doom, he waited. And the High King died, choked on a salmon bone, and it seemed to Fionn that all the heroic deaths were going out of the world, that a warrior like Gull could die of starvation, that a High King could choke to death. But the High King's son was elected to succeed him, Carbra Lificar, no friend to the Fianna, he, long jealous of their power, their popularity. And Carbra spread rumours, and for the first time that Fionn had ever known it, people stopped answering their doors to the Fianna when they knocked. People turned their backs on them, did not help them, called them brigands, asked why they were paying tribute to the High King and to the Fianna both. Was not one set of tribute enough? And so when the High King asked the Fianna to come and treat with him and feast with him, Fionn McCool did not want to go. He did not want to look at this young, arrogant man across a table for him and pretend to play nice. He wanted to teach him a lesson. He told himself that he did not. He told himself that it was more fitting that he send a deputy. That it was a show of strength, a show of power, to show Carbra that he could not summon the great Fionn McCool. That Fionn McCool did not come running when he was asked. He sent his grandson, Oscar. A man so full of prickly pride, such a stranger to fear, that after one meeting between Oscar and the king, there was war. Oscar would not give his weapon to the king as a sign of peace and friendship. To be asked, he felt, was an insult. And so he took offence and he took the Fianna who had come with him, and he left the king. And Fionn could not go against his grandson, not without shaming their family, not without making the Fianna seem weak, with infighting and discord. And so he set the place for the battle. He told the High King that they would meet at the Hill of Gaura, and he gathered his army, and he closed his ears to the sound of fairy lamenting, and he closed his eyes to the visions of washers at the ford, washing the blood of the army of the Fianna out of the clothes of the Fianna. And of course, Clan Morna went to the High King. And so when Carbra Lificar led his great army to the hill of Gaura, Fionn's Fianna were outnumbered twenty to one. And every nineteenth warrior was a brother or a sister, or had been the summer before. And Fionn saw the pain and bewilderment in the eyes of his own warriors. As they prepared for a fight they knew they could not win. Oscar was not afraid. Oscar was a stranger to fear. And Fionn found himself looking to his grandson for hope, for optimism. He looked about him for the faces of those he loved. There were so few left. There was Quilta Macronon, and there were his six sons, fine warriors all. There was Oscar. He reached a hand out instinctively for Skiolon's head, but some time before that, Fionn had been out hunting, and Skiolon had started up a deer, and Fionn had thought, that is her. That is Sive. And he could not call back Skiolon. 
and so he crushed his dog between his legs. And the deer sprang away from his hand, and he did not know if he was right or wrong to save her. And there was no furry head for his hand to rest on now. And there was no Oshin, and there was no Dermid, and there was no Eoktok. But there was Oscar. There was Oscar laughing at the washers in the ford, taunting the fairy music, asking who had something in their eye that there were tears in there. And Fionn set his heart to Oscar, and joined the battle by his side. And Oscar fought like a wave. He fought like thunder. He fought like a force of nature. He cut down and cut through the army. And he did not pause and he did not stop. And he cut his way towards the king. They were so hopelessly outnumbered. Fionn began to see it when Oscar's hands began to shake. When the strength began to fail him, even him, even Oscar, who had no fear, who had no hesitation, even he began to tire. He rallied when he saw the High King, drove himself towards him, and the High King Carbra threw his spear of seven spells through Oscar's body. And Oscar fell to one knee, casting his own spear, killing the High King. And Fionn saw him fall, and he felt his own heart starting in his chest like a deer. And he looked around him at the armies, the warriors of the High King running now, but so few of the Fianna were left. Quilcha made his way to Oscar's side and Oscar laughed at him with blood on his teeth for weeping and Fionn stumbled to the side of his grandson. He told Oscar, I can heal you. I can heal you by the magic in my hands and Oscar laughed at him as well and he said no. That was a spear of nine spells. And your magic cannot heal me. But Fionn cupped the water in his hand all the same, and he poured it into Oscar's mouth, and it did nothing. And as he poured it again and again into the dead throat of his grandson, he remembered another young man, wounded by the tusk of a boar, lying gasping in a pool of his own blood and he remembered holding back not healing Dermid and he wondered if this was his doom for letting Dermid die to watch Oscar die and he sat stunned in the ruin of his life in the ruin of all he had created and he saw the bodies about him. He saw how painfully few were left alive. And he knew he had not the heart to start again. And so Fionn McCool gathered his weapons. And he walked into the setting of the sun. And he walked to his place of testing on the coast. And he put his foot against the first ledge. And he looked out. The sun was low and it was almost dark. It was almost the end. He could see the waves below still. The hungry rocks. He could see the ledge on the other side, just barely. And he gathered his strength.
and he leapt. This podcast was produced and edited by Oisin Ryan. You can find out more about us on our website, candlelittales.ie. And we're on all the social media, so like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at Candlelit Tales, or send us a message to get onto our mailing list. For more videos and live streams, like and subscribe to our Candlelit Tales YouTube channel, which now has a Candlelit Tales for Kids playlist, hashtag Candlelit Tales. Liking and subscribing to our channels really helps us grow and get to more people. And if you're able to give us more direct support, you can chip in a few bob at patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales or make a one-time donation through the PayPal button on our website. We also do really like to hear back from you with any questions, requests or comments, leave them in the section below. If you want to find out about our courses, anything like that, just drop us a line. And we especially appreciate you listening.